everybody, it's Adam from IHP, and we are here with another episode of JC Unplugged. We've got Carlos, the IHP staff. Um, I was typing up the questions the other night, and I wrote down that this is our fifth year doing this. So, five, you know, fifth year. Um, it's our first one of the new year, so I want to take the opportunity to wish everybody a happy new year that's watching. Um, and like always, we're just going to dive right into the questions. Um, what was one of the best networking strategies that worked for you when you were first starting out as a trainer? Speak to anyone who would listen. That was, that was, a, that was a phrase I heard, and that, that was it. It wasn't so much as networking, because I've never been a network kind of guy, although I have network. I'm always, people say I'm always in work mode. It's, I'm not in work mode. No more than uh, Carlos Santana, the guitarist, is... You know, he's in musician mode, he takes his guitar everywhere, Jesus Christ is always working. No, that's who he is. When he wants to relax, he plays the guitar. When he's working, he plays the guitar. When he, when he wants to create, he plays the guitar. That's me. This stuff here is my guitar. So, if I'm at the um, produce section and somebody says, what's IHP? Ding! Round one. I'm on. I'm on. I'm in seminar mode. <laughs> Bang! And if somebody else passes by and overhears, oh, nutrition, oh, my back, my back hurts too, then I'm seminaring to two people right by the cucumbers. That's what it is. If I'm at a wedding, okay, if I'm at a wedding and I'm at a, at a table and somebody sees that maybe I'm broad, shoulders or something, you work out, bing, round one. And before you know it, nobody's dancing at the table because I'm running a seminar. <laughs> and I'll get up and I'll do, you know, the anterior reach and so... I don't network per se because, I mean, what, what is that? Going out and talking to people and then they talk to people and then you talk to the people they talk to? To me, that's just standard mode of operations. That's what you, that's what you should be doing. You are on all the time. This is, if this is not what you live, then go do what you live. If you like photography, then go take pictures and try to make that your business because then you don't ever work. You know, 10,000 hours. You want to see, now, now that's philosophically. You want to see how it works with time? 10,000 hours to perfection? Okay, so if I work eight hours selling stocks. <laughs> another good marker. Eight hours selling stocks, and then I do two hours of photography. Photos, and this is stocks, right? And I get a guy who works in photography. Maybe not making that kind of money, but he enough to pay his bills, but he loves, that. that's all he does. He works 12 hours in photography. Well, fast forward this five years. How many hours does this guy have? How many hours does this guy have? This guy here better be good at stocks because you'll never be great at photography. This guy here may be an award-winning photographer because with this kind of practice, seven days a week, you can't, you can't beat him. That's how you get to 10,000 hours. So it works philosophically. And you can break down the hours to 10,000 hours. Easy. Okay, there you go. All right. So I'm going to read this. See, uh, I try to rephrase it a little bit. What's the most effective way to analyze a specific sport movement? Okay, so probably a skill movement on a field, on the court, in order to create exercises that enhance the performance for those movements? Well, this is also an evolution. In the old days, we worked out with machines and we did bench presses, flies, leg presses, leg extension, leg curls, and we said, that doesn't look like a sport. So we would take pictures and we'd go, ha, huh, do something that looks like this. And that was a step up. And that was like, wow, you gotta be ground based, and you would get synchronicity and multiple joints, multiple planes, fantastic. And we got stuck with the pictures. So we started training pictures and we got in a lot of trouble. So now you have to train a video. You have to look at the video. And not only at, at what it is happening. So if you're looking at a jump shot, you can't look at the jump shot. You have to look at the setup to the jump shot. So take your replay, rewind it about a second or two, and then you have to look at what's creating it. Because oftentimes what you're creating is momentum. How? You're not creating momentum by generating forces. You're creating momentum by transferring energy. So uh, you'll find that a, a vertical jump is not this. This is what a vertical jump is from a standstill, but not when you're playing basketball. 
All of a sudden, there's a lead step. Well, there's a lead step from what? From a run. There's your energy. The energy for the jump is not created in the jump. It's created in the run. And then the stiffness of the legs via the, the knees and hips and, and ankles convert horizontal momentum to, to vertical lift. And that's how these guys can get 42 inches without squatting. As a matter of fact, if they squat, they can't get 42 inches. So you have to analyze a video, roll it back, and see what the setup is. And you have to start understanding. We've got to get more advanced. You've got to understand that the balance you see on a surfer is not balance. The balance you see in a surfer is the utilization of physical qualities that automatically balance a system so that guy's not balancing. He only needs a basic balance to be called a surfer. Once that happens, no more balance is behavior. He uses uh, conservation of angular momentum and all of these centripetal force and all of this to balance a system just like when you, when you, when you uh, push a bike, it kind of balances itself due to the speed. People have to understand that that is life and that is function. So they want to train, they want to train the bike balancing. And if you look at a picture and you go like this to a bike, it falls. They have to understand that it's momentum that balances that. And then they'll stop training balance and they'll stop doing some of the dumb things that they do, like throwing a medicine balls from a BOSU ball and all the stupidity that we see. Once you understand what it is that you're seeing, the training is real simple. And then We'll, we'll talk about whether you train the entire movement, because we fell in love with that. Train the entire movement or train partials of that movement, then practice the movement. We're now in the discovery phase of what is really more effective. Training the movement, swinging a, an axe to get better for, uh, for baseball, or training 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the diagonal chops, medicine ball throws, things like that that are partial and then say, all right, now get in the batting cage and hit 100 balls. So, you know, Mel Siff called that out about 20 years ago. He called me out on it. He asked me a couple of questions when I was doing balance, when I was doing stability ball training, balancing on the stability ball training, BOSU, uh, voodoo board, and all that. He called me out on it. I gave him the explanation that I had. And now, rewind 20 years, Mel Siff was right. You can't produce forces if you're an in not if you're not balanced. Now we expand that. Now we expand that. You can't produce force without utilizing the momentum that naturally occurs in the in the in the in the activity. So then now not only does it change, but it, it evolves to another level. It, you know, it's easy, but it can get it can get complicated. Alright. Do you believe that there's one type of recovery that does it all? I say sleep. Exactly. <laughs> I was going to say, if I had to choose one, it would be sleep. Random eye movement. Not laying in bed, although that, that helps, and being quiet, that helps. But that random eye movement, when you're in deep sleep, that's what goes, that's what opens up the pharmacy. That's what opens up the pharmacy. You know, otherwise, you're, you're, you're in front of the pharmacy, but there's no doors open. You can't get to any good stuff. But when you go into random eye movement and then the doors open, then, ooh, oh, wait a minute, growth hormone, testosterone, oh, here, there, cortisol, bang, bang. The crazy stuff starts to happen, and that's where you recover. People don't understand. You don't get better in the gym. The gym is the stimulus. The adaptation occurs when you rest. Right. So, you know, beware. Beware, and you won't overtrain all right. Uh, it's kind of like a track and field question. When training for shot put, javelin, hammer, those type of those type of events, explosive events, what exercises would you implement and why? Uh, you have to do the lateral reaching lunges, diagonal chops, low to high. Um, Ten o'clock, two o'clock rotations. Those are just a must. And depending on your style of throwing. Skaters, lateral reaching lunges, and then you can compound those with <coughs> skaters. Because whether you, you're turning or in here, you're going to have to push off. And more importantly, anterior reaches. Because when, when you throw here, especially javelin, how fast you stop your forward momentum when you're, when you're taking the lead steps. 
how fast you stop your forward momentum and drive this hip back will determine how fast your hips rotate. Then that 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock rotation gives you that stiffness to turn the shoulders with the hips. But if you, if you can't stop, boom, there, you're not going to get the hip to turn. So again, the lead step in rotation, even this, transferring momentum forward, and then you're stopping that forward momentum and driving this hip back. And there's where you get that spin. Whether it's throwing, uh, batting, you know, any kind of swinging, or even changing direction. That's, that's the money right there. And coincidentally, look at the knee angles and hip angles. You'll see that they're nowhere near 90 degrees. So I'm going, okay, all the squatting, even parallel, which is not a super deep squat. Why are you squatting even parallel? All of the functional knee extension, usually it's unilateral, and then it's 15 degrees. 15 degrees. I could show it to you all day in the NBA, any kind of jump, I don't care which jump it is. The leg that's actually taking off will rarely bend to 20. I, I'm, I'm guessing 15 is the, the sweet spot. So if you need knee stiffness, an explosive knee extension is like a lockout. When you punch, you don't generate forces from here. The force is here. Man, that's why Bruce Lee could have that one inch punch. Where did he go? He went like 10 degree knee, uh, elbow, and then he went, but he just locked it out and then gave you a, a turn. And that's how he could generate all that force. So again, we have to look at specificity. <clears throat> we're big on squatting, we're big on Olympic weightlifting, and none of those angles are used in the stuff that we're trying to improve. Somebody's got to ask the question, and so we ask the questions and change the training. But do some of those traditional exercises like squatting and maybe even some Olympic lifts, do they add to some of the, when you start going into some of the more um, functional exercises of specificity, do some of those traditional exercises give those specificity exercises a little bit of boost? Yeah, I support you can. I suppose you can, and I suppose they do, but so do other things. So, for example, a car push. So what's better, a squat or a car push? A squat doesn't give you ankle stiffness, and I want to see you jump without it especially off of two legs. One leg running, you have to go heel to toe because the, your center of mass is behind your foot, so you have to land with your heel and then your takeoff is here. But when you're, when you're in here, look at them. Knees are over the toes, they're on the balls of their feet and they're flying, whether it's a, it's a stationary jump shot. Look, look at them, look at them free throws. Look at the th free throws, what are they? Boom, boom, and they, they, they're in here and what's the first thing that happen? Knees go over the toes. And when they come up, they're on the balls of their feet. And when it's happening fast, all that happens is it's sped up. And I had an argument, uh, not an argument, a very nice discussion with Stu McGill. He says, no, it's flat-footed. I said, not, not, on two, not on two legs. Not on two legs. It's off the balls of the feet. Send them a ton of video. Not one of them was flat-footed. Not one of them. You can't jump that. Where am I here? So if you're going to do a partial, here, something that we hate, something that we hate that I'm going to buy now, I've always talked against it, and I'm going to buy one now, and that's a Smith machine. So take a Smith machine. Oh, it doesn't give you the right path for the squad and the bench. I don't want a squad, and I don't want a bench press. I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to do this. That's what I want to be able to do, because that's jumping. I don't want to do that. So you go ahead and do Olympic weightlifting and let me do this and let's, let's go jump, see who jumps. Okay. Anything else? No. You all right? Anything. Um, yeah, but. <laughs> what was an obstacle that was difficult for you to overcome as a trainer or when you were training? Because you still go out on the gym floor and train. When you were a young trainer, what was a, a tough obstacle to overcome? I think I've become a better listener, a better coach. I was more a technician. No, you're gonna do it this way, why? Because this is the way it's done. Instead of trying to, trying to see why the person did wanna do it and then maybe they did need to do it. So you're a little bit more on the, you're gonna do it my way, adamant about it? Well, yeah, my way, which is the academic way. You know, this is the way and we squat because why? Because squatting is the king of all exercise. But I don't wanna squat, I, you're gonna squat. 
And if you're afraid of squat, that's the first thing. We got to get rid of the fear of squatting because that, right. that. So it was, yeah, my way. I was, I was, I came up uh, through school and all the, you know, all the certifications and everything. And I was traditional weightlifting and had traditional strength and I was traditional this and traditional that and traditional that. And by God, we were going traditional. And now, um, now I don't really care about the exercises because what I want to do is I want to get in the client's head. Because we, we reset the barometer of the human world and that has nothing to do with exercise selection or nothing. Nothing. It has to do with what can I put together in this place to give that person, whether it's a housewife or a person rehabbing a back or a fighter, give them the experience that we're trying to get ready for. If it's a housewife, she doesn't want like to lose her energy at 2, 3, 4 o'clock when the kids are really cranky, everything's cranky, husband's coming, boom, 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 she's got it. And that, that's when she's got to pick it up because that's what dinner is. Go pick up the kids. And, eh, I don't want her to, to be tired. And if she has a bad back, I don't want her to carry the kids like that because she's not thinking. So when we're doing deadlifts, when we're doing clinch curls, when we're doing everything, I'm putting her in the house. Now it's 3 o'clock. Now you're tired. Oh, by the way, you got to do 30 seconds of a Versa Climber or an Aerodyne to get you pre-fatigued. So I, I want to get you to 3 o'clock now. So, oh, you're tired? Now it's time to deadlift you know, 40 pounds, because um, the kid weighs 27, I'm gonna give her a little, a little uh, cushion there, 40, 45 pounds. Now it's time to deadlift. Now it's time to clinch curl. How much is the kid, 27 pounds? Well, we're gonna clinch curl 35. Tired. Oh, and then you gotta go up the stairs carrying the muscle. Okay, here's a sandbag, and then step up. Boom, boom, boom. And then I'm gonna coach her in that crisis, trying to mimic the activity. So, you'll know you're successful, because when she's carrying the kid and all that, she goes, man, I've got great energy at four o'clock, and the other day I was gonna carry Johnny, he was, you know, running a fever and all that, and I remembered your words. And I, I was gonna go like this the old way, and, and I remembered your words, and I fixed my posture, and I picked him up with no problems. My back is solid. I've never had a back problem like again. <clears throat> okay? That's when you know you do your job. So in here, take them, take the person to the activity. So when the activity comes, they come back to the training. And you'll know you were successful because they'll tell you. They'll tell you. I remember you. Your, your words rang in my ears. So. All right. Uh, this one is always finds its way into questions, and I don't think it can be talked about enough because it keeps getting brought up. What, are, what is your view of creatine, and do you and would you recommend it to your clients? Creatine is gas, okay? So what creatine does, it loads the energy molecule inside the muscle so you don't have to access it through the bloodstream or, and it super saturates it. So as the muscle is, is using it, it doesn't have to go to the bloodstream, recharge it. It's right there in, in high concentration. So if you want to um, repeat, okay, uh, activities such as sets, you want to repeat at high intensity and have the energy there, creatine is awesome. It has also a byproduct of uh, transferring more volume of water, more, more water into the muscle. And it is theorized that when the muscle stretches with, with, um, with water, one of the theories is that there are receptors on the membrane that go, oh my God, I'm growing, boom, speed up RNA, DNA production, blah, 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 replication and everything. So, they're, they're, they think that may, that may be one of the um, mechanisms by how creatine puts on muscle. Okay, uh, you don't have to um, you don't have to uh, saturate it, so you don't have to do the 25 grams per day, which a lot of people will get GI distress. You can do three, four grams a day for, and at the end of 30 days, you're saturated without any any uh, super uh, loading. And so for people who want to gain weight or don't mind gaining weight and want to get stronger due to better training, creatine is awesome. Creatine can be taken by anybody. Old people benefit huge from creatine. Young kids, eight years old, nine years old, benefit from creatine because apart from the performance enhancement capabilities, now creatine is a brain food. Anything that has to do with brain from uh, attention deficit disorder all the way to various things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and stuff like that, creatine is being really, really researched to, to treat those brain-associated dysfunctions. So, safe, effective, in more ways than one. So, if you want that, creatine is awesome. If you want another booster, 
that doesn't work like creatine, uh, and beta alanine is another one. And beta alanine is a precursor to carnosine, and carnosine is one of those things that will buffer hydrogen. So it lets you go harder and harder and harder, but instead of because of an energy thing, it's, it, it neutralizes the stuff that inhibits you. So it removes the brakes. Okay? Creatine gives you more gas. Um, beta alanine removes the brakes. Got it? So you have two options. Oh, you want a performance enhancement without weight gain? <clears throat> beta alanine. Oh, you, you want weight gain like a football player? Creatine. You don't care, you just want good quality training, you can do both. I also read, uh, watched actually a couple of videos, in addition to the performance benefits and the brain benefits, they're now also looking at the protective benefits that creatine gives against um, osteoporosis mm. and osteopenia. I haven't, I haven't so uh, read was, about that, but that... So it's... It's... Um, it's, it's... I like it. Yeah, it, it. the thing is that... <laughs> Ignorance is, you know, is, is rampant. Once upon a time, the NCAA, uh, National Collegiate Association, right, uh, banned creatine because they thought it was a steroid back in the day. Uh, they got on creatine when the wrestlers died in 1995, 96, something like that. Six wrestlers died. They claimed they were on creatine. We started a creatine panel. Uh, and funded research out the wazoo, and we tried to cramp muscles, we tried to dehydrate people, we tried to overheat people with creatine, and it turns out that creatine hydrated the muscles, so prevented dehydration, lowered body temperature, so it prevented overheating, okay, and um, volumized the muscle and, and flooded the muscle with plasma, so it helped cramping. So everything that it was blamed for, it actually prevented. That's his life. And if you want to get further information on creatine, Joey Antonio, Dr. Antonio is a great resource yeah. to follow. And Dr. Kreider, who for, for many years was the, the uh, uh, US authority on creatine. So it's awesome. All right, uh, let's go into some, uh, some, some insight from you. Um, compound movements, what are some of the disadvantages and advantages? Well, you know, when, when functional training starts, and, uh, what is functional training? Oh, we train movements, not muscles. Ooh, movements. And then we got into the long definitions of functional training. Functional training is multi-planar, uh, multi-articulation training that involves the integrate, and like, uh, the definitions were like this. I remember Michael Clark and NASM, and I roomed with Michael Clark on the yet yeah, perform better too for a couple of years when, when we had to room to save money, right? And then eventually we got our own rooms. But Michael Clark, I was editing his uh, NASM book and he was editing my functional training book. And I remember, it's like, Mike, why do you have to, why do, you have to do these, these uh, periodization cycles, the cycles were this big? He used acronyms. And he used acronyms he couldn't keep, keep up with. He goes, you know, the, the P, E, C, T, whatever that is? Yeah, that cycle, you know? And that's because he's a genius. Michael Clark is a freaking genius and that's the way he thinks. So. When, when, um, when, we, when we did that, we said, ooh, movement. Okay, and then we started doing movement and movement and movement and movement, and then I'm going, well, wait a minute. The movement is the final, is the final outcome. I need to train things. It's like the replay. The replay is not, is not what you're training. You're training the setup. Well, the outcome is the same thing. The outcome is the outcome. Batting is the outcome. Jumping is the outcome. What are the constituents of that? And do I train each of those constituents optimally when I put them in a comp compound movement? So the theory of the compound movement is, well, what, what if there's a weak link? Well, use it in a chain. The weak link will become stronger. OK, but it takes longer. I found out it takes longer. You can take that weak link, OK? For, for example, if it's, if it's uh, 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 stiffness. Okay, if it's stiffness and you're using, well, this is stiffness and this is stiffness, okay? But if you want rotational stiffness, do you want stiffness with this movement? Okay, how are you gonna do the movement? Medicine ball throw, okay, how much rotational stiffness are you gonna get out of a medicine ball throw? Yeah, you'll get some, but it's gonna be about 40%, <laughs> fast. How about batting, same thing. Okay, so what else do you do? Plank. So then you go, okay, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna do this, I'm not gonna do the hips, I'm just gonna do this. And you do a 10 o'clock, two o'clock, and you separate the stiffness, the core stiffness, and you give it the best 
exercise that you can. Man, you'll create stiffness in 10 days. That body will get strong in 10 days. Then if you need this, then you do your lateral reaching lunge. Because lateral reaching lunge, your stiffness is gonna take a beating because it's gonna be predicated on what you can handle with dumbbells and your hamstrings can handle. And the whole movement. So when you do a movement, some of the areas are going to be limited by physics, not by weakness, by physics to what other areas can do. And so you're not really, you're not really bringing up that area. So now I've become a fan of, okay, the compound movement, all right, why are you doing the compound movement? And do we have constituents of that compound movement that are still compound, but they use what's called, it, and Gary Gray, uh, Gray coined this 20 years ago, isolated integration. You're still working isolated. I'm still working total body rotation. But if I go this way and I don't move and I keep my feet flat versus a lateral reaching lunge or diagonal chop, I got a wider base, okay, full base, and then I don't have to, no skills, and then I'm going here, isometric, or boom, boom, boom. I'm still integrated, but I'm really, really zeroing in on this. Isolated integration, hamstrings, okay. What if I go lordotic, all right, and I go in here, and I tilt the pelvis forward with that lordotic position? The hamstring gets a bigger bang than if I allow the whole movement to occur with a little bit of lumbar or thoracic uh, flexion. Got it? So if I want to bang the hamstrings, I can tweak the lateral reaching lunge to really bang the hamstrings. Same thing with that, um, with that cable deadlift. I can tweak how much hamstring I give you, how much glute I give you, and how much paraspinals I give you based on different things. So, you can use isolated integration to work on the components of a compound move and get faster, faster adaptations than just doing the, the compound move. I have, I have played around with that, I have tested that over 20 years, hands down. And, and that's one of the reasons that we get such great results so fast. One of the things we're known for is how fast people improve here. And it's, and it's this philosophy and these methods because the system is function and then the, the, the system becomes, okay, movement, all right, compound movement, and then the system evolves to isolated integration applications. And then you have your methods. Your methods are your protocols and your exercises and stuff like that, right? So these things are what allow people to go, wow, my back is rehab so fast because we, we acknowledge that. All right. Cool. Last question. Um, exercise that we do here quite often are the band swimmers. What are some of the, the different variations and why do we do the different variations? What are the benefits of the different variations? I'm sure you got some stick figures you can draw for us. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> at first, we were, we were one of the first. I'm not saying that we were, but we were certainly at the forefront. Of, the band, of all band exercises, everything bands, we did the first band and pulley, the essence of band and pulley systems, I think we did that in 2000, 2000. I was working on it in 1999, and I think publication time was 2000. So we have, to this day, have done the most extensive work on cable and pulley band uh, training and vector training in the history of fitness. I think nobody's ever touched it. One big manual, almost uh, 280 uh, pages, and two, two DVDs, all right? So we know band training. And that doesn't mean we were right on everything back then. We evolved, but we have always been up front on the, on, on the band training. So when we, uh, when we looked at the, the swimmers, we said you different types of swimmers. We have the compound swimmers, we have the isolated swimmers, and here, because what range do you want to work? If you want to work the terminal range here, okay, I got to be up, Okay, and then I can put the, uh, the band kind of above my head, and then right here is where you're gonna get, because here, you got nothing. The lever arm, the lever arm starts to open, 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 and you get maximum lever arm here. So if you want terminal, here. If you want the top, then you gotta bend down, or you gotta have the band up there. But know that you're gonna get here, and once, once you're past the optimum lever arm, nothing's gonna happen here. So we said, okay, boom, we can go here, kind of at face level, and then go down, see, go down, I'm opening up, and then kind of close. 
So we, we went with the compound rows, good for the abs, good for the lats, awesome. Then we separately, we went for extensions, and the extensions were normally lower or about knee height, and we would reach here, and then we would go boom, and then we went with everything A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, and we were awesome. One arm, two arms, simultaneous, alternating, we went nuts. Okay, then we said, oh shit, if we, one compound move is awesome, then two compound moves back to back is even better. So we went vroom, vroom. And I did that for a little bit. And I'm going, all right. And it, I just wasn't feeling it. I was feeling it here, and then I was feeling it up here. In the middle, I had this whole range where it was nothing. I'm going, what's going on? And what's going on is you're not working the paraspinals or the crunch because the momentum of the other direction is what's giving you the initial lift or the initial momentum. And then when you get to the terminal where the, where the band starts applying uh, the force or the lever arm on a cable allows you to, to, to uh, provide some force, you already come with so, so much momentum that the muscle's not doing anything. So if I'm in here, the band's going to pull me this way. Right here, this is free of charge. As soon as, as, soon as I'm here, it's free Wah! to about here. So basically, all you're doing on this is this. So my question is, why are you doing it? And if you tell me, hey, it's a busy station, I want to get a little bit terminal here and terminal there, and I want to keep them moving because I don't want them going, hey, hey, hey. Metabolic, too. Metabolic, yeah, keep it Great. Then I know you know what you're doing. But you can't tell me, oh, I'm working core. You're not working a whole lot of core because 75% of your move is assisted momentum. You're not even creating the momentum. The band of cable is. So you're not doing anything. You're just doing terminal here, terminal there. So if you want to work, then you got to work here, here, here. Here's another problem. Remember what I said when you work a movement, you're limited to the weakest component of the movement? All right. What's stronger, a crunch or an extension? Which one? Yeah, what can you handle more weight with? All right, so now I'm crunching with pink bands because that's what I can handle here. So now you're not even crunching because you're crunching with like five pounds. <clears throat> because why? Because the extension limits you. So you have to be very careful when you're doing compound movements to make sure that one range, one, one partial range of that motion doesn't limit you on the other one. Because swimming or, or there, nothing involves this with momentum in the middle. There's nothing. Nothing. If you're jumping, this is all gravity. You're going to push against gravity. So it's not like you're going to have gravity help you up and then you go, okay, the, no. So you have to start analyzing. When you start thinking of compound movements, say, is there an angle of this entire movement that renders another angle useless? That's the key. That's the key analysis. Is there part of an angle or part of this movement that renders the other part uh, useless? And if it does, why are you doing this part? Just do this one and this one and this one and this one. So if I'm doing extensions with um, pink, let's say we're using the Predator, and my, with single pink, my goal is to get to double pinks at eight feet, right? Here, single pink, double pink, that's nothing for a crunch. The crunch, I'm starting with maybe double greens, maybe double oranges, certainly double oranges. And, I, and the goal is to get the triple orange. There's no way you're ever going to get to double orange on extensions. See? So you're not going to know this for every exercise. But if you're aware, you can start catching yourself on many. Stay with the range that's effective, optimize that range, and go on to the next one. All right, good stuff. That was the first one of 2019. We'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Have a great week. Have a great 219.